Okay, so we left off um, at this particular photograph. This would have been the second autopsy that was conducted, is that correct? Uh, I can't tell you which order they were in, I'm sorry. Okay, but you attended all four? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. And we already talked about Joe Jr. that was one of the children, so was this another autopsy of a child? Yes. Okay. And when you... Can we get the... Oh, it is? Okay. With respect to this um, particular autopsy, you had definitely more remains with this one. Is that right? That is correct. Now, did you observe anything unusual with respect to this autopsy? Uh, unusual. Any trauma? Yes. What did you observe? Um, if you look at the cranial uh, area, which is uh, this area right here, um, this area should not look like that. Um, if it were intact, it would look more like this area over here. So there were um, uh, significant defects in the skull area. Were there actually um, multiple blunt force trauma to this particular? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to discern exactly how many points of impact there would be with a particular individual? Um, sometimes yes and sometimes no. And children, again, it's particularly hard because of the flexibility of their overall skeletons. So can a child actually be hit with an item in their head and not have their skull fracture? Yes. In this particular case, we see that it, it appears to be that most of the bones are dark, like we talked about before. Does that mean the remains for this particular child were all interred? Yes, they were all together. You can tell they were interred uh, based on the completeness of the skeleton. Were you still, I, I know you said completeness of the skeleton, but will you, were you still actually missing pieces of the skeleton? Oh, yes. Other than blunt force trauma, did you observe anything else unusual with respect to this particular victim? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. This is Exhibit 542. Thank you. Would it refresh your recollection to review your report to determine if there was any other trauma? It would, although um, that case number is extremely small. If you wouldn't mind telling me the last two digits, that would be very helpful. So I can open the correct case number. Is that 8-7? Eight, I believe it's 8-8. Eight, 8-8. Eight. Eight, eight. Yes, okay. Uh, and you have asked me other than the blunt force trauma to the skull, is there any other trauma that you observe to this particular victim? If we could know what page she's referring to. Um, I would be right now, I'm working on page two of my report. Uh, no, I, don't, I, I didn't record anything that was uh, describes parietal, cranial, uh, that's all in the skull. Okay. Now you indicated um, that you were at the autopsies. At some point during the autopsy, were you presented with a particular item that was recovered from the graves that could be consistent with the weapon? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 745 and 7... 745 or 43A. Do you recognize this particular item? It bears a strong resemblance to what I was presented with. Okay. So this particular item was brought in during the autopsies? Yes. Okay. Now you indicated, um, and this is a sledgehammer, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. You indicated that a child can actually be hit with an item and not have an actual skull fracture. That's correct. 
Would that be true even of an item like the sledgehammer? Objection to foundation, Chair, testify she couldn't go to cause of death or any forensic injury. I think it would be unlikely. Okay. And moving on to Exhibit 551. Do you recognize this? Yes. And what are we looking at here? Uh, we are looking at the uh, remains of uh, an adult and uh, an adult with blood force trauma. Do you recall if this particular adult had been identified? Uh, at the time of the autopsy, I, I'm clear that they, she had been positively identified. Uh, by the time I wrote my report, she had been. And this was summer mistake? Yes. And then I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibits 366 and 362. And are these basically close-up photos of what we observed in exhibit 551? Yes. And can you tell us what, what's depicted here? Uh, I'm going to use a pointer if you don't mind. Um, so if we start up here, we're looking at essentially the right portion of the skull. For the record, uh, the exhibit on the right is exhibit 366, and that's the one you're using the later laser pointer at. Yes, although uh, they're very, very similar. This is this exhibit is a cleaner version of what's here without this postcranial material present. And so, that would be 362 on the left-hand side. Correct. I, I guess, I guess. So explain to us during the autopsy, um, you indicated that there's some material there. What do you do with that? This material? Yes. That material is um, handed over to the crime scene investigation unit. Does someone examine that material as well? Yes, they are. Oh, it, it is done at autopsy and usually present while it's happening. But you were not in this particular case? I was not part of the, the examination of it, no. Okay. Now we, we see some bones um, in the photograph on the left that appear to be weathered as well. Do you see that? Yes. Do you have an opinion as to how long those remains were outside of the grave? Uh, about six months or so. Uh, the, there's still some, it looks like tissue adherence along the, um, along the vertebral column. There's still a little bit of, uh, of moist tissue. And again, is that an estimate on your behalf? It's a broad estimate. Okay. And looking at the photograph on the right, can you tell us what that is? So the photograph on the right, you're looking at, again, the right uh, portion of the skull. This is the frontal bone, so that would be the nasal area. Uh, this would be the right section of the jaw, this would be the left, and this is also part of the left section of the jaw. Some of this is interior uh, cranial material. This is uh, also parietal and a little bit of occipital, so um, here. Uh, and that is mostly a collection of cranial material. How do you determine what it is that actually belongs to the cranium. So because we see in this particular exhibit there's a lot of little pieces. Uh, so cranial bones are, are kind of distinct from other bones in the body. They're, um, they're in the category of flat bones, but they're not really flat. They're kind of uh, rounded. And on the outside, the exterior portion, there's some muscle markings. And in the interior portion, there is um, Markings that indicate uh, the meningeal vessels, the vessels that surround your brain, they give their own kind of little marking on the inside, and so I'm um, using the markings. So, do you ever attempt to put this back together so on the right hand side? When you say ever, I have. Okay. But um, we don't do it frequently. Why is that? Uh, it's a lot of work and it doesn't yield a lot for the work. Typically, also because um, we try not to put edges back together again that have been separated from each other, unless it's going to produce some kind of information. Like if we were able to tell which direction the blow was coming from, or a um, gunshot, or, or whatever 
then we might put it all together so we would have a better picture. But typically, if we can see the, like in this case, you can see along the edges how it broke, it's a little less profitable to do it. Although I do think we made some attempt in this. We didn't boom anything. I think we did some in hand assignment. That would be pretty regular. Is there anything about that particular cranium that caused it to break in more pieces than, for example, the one we saw in the child? Okay. Do, do you have experience or any training or educational background in determining what causes cranial remains to fragment? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us what that is? Uh, it does have to do with the flexibility and the um, direction of force, and uh, so the difference between the previous and this was that um, these bones had more inorganic material in, in proportion to organic material. What does that mean? They were less uh, flexible, less collagen, less sponge. Is there anything else that can affect? <coughs> Um, the cranium breaking into more pieces. Many, many things, but none that I could think of that have parents. Okay. Yeah. Other than the blunt force trauma that you observed to the skull, was there any other trauma that you observed to this particular remains? I would have to consult. May I consult my report? Yes. Okay. Doesn't look like I recorded any other uh, traumas at all. Okay. And then moving on to what's been marked as People's Exhibit 382, oh, I'm sorry, 380 for identification purposes. Do you recognize this? Yes. And can you tell us what this is? Uh, these are the remains of uh, uh, Joseph Nixet. Now, these remains appear to be different than the other remains that we reviewed. Yes. Can you tell us why? Um, the fabric was uh, surrounding the body more carefully. They also, uh, uh, this body was further down, so it was more protected from uh, animal incursion. So there were, um, uh, there was more to recover. When you say that this body was protected, what is it that you mean by that? I mean, it was protected by a layer of soil and um, possibly another individual on top of him. Uh, so that individual was partially eaten and, and he was protected. Now, I would object to speculation unless that's an observation that the great That is my observation of the great The objections are the way. Is there the answer, any? The answer and explanation will remain. Thank you. Is there anything with respect to this particular photo? We see what appears to be some cloth um, around Mr. McStay. Do you see that? I do. Is there anything about that that would um, contribute to the fact that he was more intact? Uh, a cloth protection kind of protects the body against either the acid or base uh, qualities of the soil that is um, desiccating or destroying. Now, in order to do the actual autopsy, is all that fabric and everything else removed? Yes, it is. And moving on to what's been marked as Exhibit 382, do you recognize this? That looks like the wire that was tied around the body. Did you recognize what area that's from? Uh, as I recall, it was mid-torso, upper mid-torso. And showing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 557, do you recognize that? Yes. And what's depicted in that photo? Um, we're looking at the mid-torso region approximately. That, that um, big bladed thing here is the hip bone. Uh, and these are ribs. And this is uh, the wire that is uh, also tied with fabric uh, that is denoted uh, in the report. Now again, and I know that you testified about, I'll, let's strike that, you testified previously about the order of things in the graves. 
um, and that different environmental issues can impact the placement of things in the grades. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, and that would be true for grade A as well? Yes. <clears throat> Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 392, do you recognize that? I do. And can you tell us what that is? That is a tibia, uh, and next to it, uh, you can barely see it, there is a fibula. So uh, these are uh, labels, lower leg. Okay, and what's the significance of that? Uh, the reason, uh, well, the, the significance of it, if you're asking me what I noted on it, what I noted on it was that there was a, um, a type of fracture that comes from um, this direction, and it, when it does that, it bows out and, uh, and breaks uh, behind. So like, if you were to go to the front of the bone and push it, because remember we talked about the bone being very flexible, even some flexibility in the belts, it's going to bend, and the process of bending, it bends too far, it splits, and that's what you're seeing. I know that you brought some things along today, potentially for demonstrative purposes. Do you have um, a tibia in there? I do not have a tibia with this kind of, uh, I'm not aware of a passive of that. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we're kind of adequately I can show you inbending, but I have to use this what they call that, but I can show you inbending on a cranial fragment. I have that. Okay, could you show us that? How do you object to the relevance of inbending of a cranial since there's no testimony there is any type of reaction to the remains in that matter? Oh. Um. And I can pass that to the jury if you like. If you want to explain what it is, it's so. May yeah, I hand this to the jury? Sure. Then. Okay. So what you're seeing is that the outer table is the part that's smoother, and the in part that has that break there that's the inner table. So what you're looking at is a skull that was impacted, embedded, and split inside where the external part looks fine. So that would um, also represent what we were talking about with respect to the tibia, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sorry. Now, did you also observe this type of embedding on some of the head trauma that you observed? I did. Other than the, and I'm not sure if I asked you this question, um, what type of trauma did you actually observe to Joseph McStay? Uh, senior. Yes. Senior, yes. Uh, I saw uh, blunt force trauma. I specifically thought it was his tibia. Um, and I believe I also saw some blunt force trauma to his head that I talked about. Is that right? If it would refresh your recollection? It yeah, will. I'm sorry. This is a, a literally not store information about this case. Yeah, so I had um, a uh, a depressed fracture and a commutative fracture. So this is a depressed fracture is when um, you have the impact and it looks like the piece that you're uh, passing around, uh, and except that on the outer part of the table is sufficient. I do have a depressed fracture with me, if that is something that you might need. Um, and if, if you can pull that out. around to the jury. Okay, so um, in the corner you can see, so you see the skull piece and there's a hole. And in the one portion of the hole you can see where the outer part of the skull is pushing, to the, but it hasn't broken all the way through, so it's not like a hole, it's like it's a compressed part, you would call that a compressed fracture. And what part of the body was the Depressed fracture that you observed on the remains of Joseph X.D. Senior? Uh, both in his, uh, the, the depressed fracture was in his cranial material. Keep 
goes out. Okay. Sorry. I think you were reviewing your report to confirm and look at whether there was any um, additional trauma to Joseph McStay Sr. Did you have an opportunity to do that? I did. And what trauma did you observe to him? Uh, there was also an additional rib uh, fracture that was as a result of blunt force trauma, and there was uh, the tibia fracture, which we've already talked about. I have no further questions, Your Honor. And the Fed's counsel has your piece. Oh, thank you. Now, the first thing that uh, you talked about on direct examination was how you approach the excavation of a, of a site that something there. And, and you talked about you went down uh, in layers. Yeah. And did I miss it? It was like 10 centimeters at a time? Was that 10 centimeters is the ideal. And is there a reason why you go down <coughs> in a structured layered format? Yes, uh, in order to preserve context. And what do you mean preserve context? Um, so context is, um, again, the way I described it before, is that uh, when an object or whatever has stopped moving, it's in its primary context. So if I were to collapse in this courtroom and lay down on the floor, I would be in my primary context. Every time I move, information is lost. So secondary context, tertiary context, etc. we have them. And um, our goal is to get as close to primary context as we can. And that means excavating in a uh, measured manner. And when you're excavating in a measured manner to, uh, to sure you know primary context, the further you go down in a grave that you're excavating, is that relevant in any way? It depends on the situation in the grave. So if you have remains inside a grave and you find things underneath the remains, is that important to you? Um, it can, it can be. And what, how can it be important? Well, sometimes it's associated with the body and sometimes it isn't. So, for example, I once had somebody with, there was six cents in the bottom of the grave and it didn't belong to the dead guy. Yeah. Now, part of the Direct examination talked about over being the uh, Sutter Wells Road. Mm -hmm. And you said you've been there many times. I have. How many times have you been there in Sutter Wells Road? Oh, at least a dozen, probably more. And these are all um, forensic uh, ventures on your part? Not all of these are forensic interests. Some people decided that that was just the ideal place to end the things. Um, so, a suicide in that location, um, sometimes again, death by misadventure. A uh, fellow who walked away from his broken ATV and we never, well, nobody saw him alive again. But I guess I'm getting at it. You were always there to help in the recovery or identification of remains. I actually did that twice with my brother uh, 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 in a recreational sense. So, is it safe to say? Well, Road is a common place where bodies are found. It is as common as many other places along the 15. Now, when you're walking the scene and pin flags being put down on human remains, and you said you were trying to pick up what you quickly identified as animal remains, just to kind of remove them out of the way. Yes. Were those? A removal be documented with a picture taken, <coughs> something I removed and put to the side. Not in the cases where it was obvious. So like where you have a, a big old cow rib and, and you know, if that's obviously food. I took pictures of the ones where someone might have, like you saw the, the previous evidence where there was, I, I, and I told you that was non-human. Yeah. Those bones kind of resemble the human arm, so I took a picture of them. The rest of them we don't document. 
femur that's this big, and the whole person would have had to have been this tall. Now, I was looking through your CV, kind of your resume, and I was Sorry. looking for your training and experience on uh, DNA. Mm -hmm. It's not documented in my CV. I don't have to be a DNA expert. You do not? No. Now, you're talking about uh, on the 12th of November, when you started to set the edges, and you said you'd like to start from an edge and you're work your way in. Is that accurate? Yes. And you said, but uh, Investigator Hunter decided to start in the center and work his way out. Yes. And one thing you said is, and I wrote down is, you were pressed for time. <laughs> yes. Why were you pressed for time? Um, if I had my druthers with a, any kind of excavation, I would have days to work on it. Uh, in most forensic cases, I have hours. Uh, it was my assumption that I still only had hours. Plus, I did have a class that afternoon. I've been working there for 20 years with hours pretty successfully. And is it true you worked at that grave site technically three days? The 11th, 12th, and 13th? No, I didn't touch the grave site on the 11th, so I didn't work on it. And I worked on the 12th, and I did not, I did not work on the 13th. Well, let me restate it. The grave site, not the grave, but the grave site. The area the of the remains are false, the yeah. whole scene. Yeah. You were there for three days. High and unusual, but yes. So in essence, you had the time to do it the way you wanted to, if, if you were in charge. I'm not even sure that that's the case. Um, I don't think any of us knew it was going to go, and, and, and when you say three days, from the perspective of the people who responded to the scene, that was day one. And, um, I didn't know we were going to get a day two. Again, we typically don't get that. So um, I might have, even if I were in charge, I've considered other types of time um, organization, but in this case, uh, I was not in charge. In charge, I was not. I'm sorry. In charge. I was not in charge. Ms. Jackson, can we go to computer four? Let me show you exhibit 539 that you testified to earlier. Yes. Now you said that the cloth material was removed and then, let me get this right, uh, you were able to see your first uh, bone. All right, so it was reflected back, not removed. You can actually see it still on the wall. Did you have to do any digging to get to that point with the trial that's in the picture? No, the child that's in the picture is in the picture for, um, um, no, actually it's not even size, it's, it's direction. Um, if you see a child in the picture, the pointing bit is north. Charles come in a lot of sizes, they could fool you. <laughs> so, getting past Thalderwell Road, how common are bodies found in on the 15 corridor between Victorville and Barca. Objection relevance. Oh, really? she, did, she did that sort of, she has an opinion or knows. They're, they're pretty frequent. Now, during your testimony, you were shown a picture of the remains of Joseph Jr., which was the frontal part of the skull and the two ribs, correct? Uh, yes, actually there were three ribs from that. Two. So I show you, not your right three. Okay. And then we show one picture of which would identify as the remains of Summer McStay, correct? Yes. And then one photograph. Do we see the photograph of Gianni? Oh, we can see a, a photograph of Gianni. The only one I remember seeing 
was, would you list the figure 25 in your report for Joseph's sake? So we can now be previously marked exhibit 752. Um, put that up. Can you put your name? That look familiar? It does look familiar, but that is. Uh, I'll zoom in on the. But the case I would take you as well. Um, so the case number, this is after Joseph to say is, um, is, is clean. So before he was in, a, in that bundle. And this is after we got everything out and uh, he'd been uh, brushed with a, a paintbrush or washed with water. So this shows the remain, at least the top half of the remains that we were able to recover and kind of put together. Yes. And from what we can tell, of one of the, as I call it, the shoulder blade, is that ever a medical degree? On um, his appears to be left side, his left upper arm bone, uh, show weather. Is that accurate? That is correct. So there was some partial exposure of him. Now, the fracture to his rib that you noted. Yes. Uh, what approximate rib would that have been? Can, you... Can I refer? I, I, don't know, I don't know that I would have. Fool's game memory moves, my friend. Um, oh, actually, it's still in place then. So it was the, uh, it says, my report says it's the, the left third rib. So if you're looking for it in <coughs> place on this photograph, it, I'm not sure you can see the fracture itself there. Yeah, there you go. Can I show it to you? If you came with a pointer for I the sure can. jury? Right there. So. so this is the left rib. And the only reason we were able to number it, by the way, I know, uh, was that it was actually still attached to the, the vertebra by um, some tissue. Nor normally, I think we don't number ribs because that's a level of specificity that's unrealistic. So here you have that. You see this, this right here? And again, that comes from an external force. In the case where we have this very uh, tip end of the rib, they have a lot less flexibility there. And uh, it's not all uncommon to like, peel or, or crack at that end. So you're looking at it, um, if I were to show you, actually, I cannot show you on my own body, but if I were to just, yeah, can I? Thank you. you. Use me. <laughs> Thank you. I just want you to be able to be. Perfectly clear in your explanation. I will face towards uh, the audience and the jury. Okay, so from a body's perspective, we always talk about it from the body side, not from our own perspective. So we'd be talking about his left side. You're, I'm going to touch you. Is that's that right? That's fine, yes. All right, so. Collarbone? Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Collarbone, one, two, three. So we're talking about about here. And so, and then the fracture, was it near the it sternum? Near the sternum. So it would have been more center. More center, yeah. Thank you for being a little model. No problem. Now, we talked about the decomposition fluid and all the different parts of your explanation of how you analyze everything. How does that come into play for this grid? Can you tell if it's Post-mortem, anti-mortem, paramortem. Can you give the light so I can, sh I can show you? Okay. This looks awful all blown up. Uh, we're sorry, we need a slightly better picture. But if you look right along here, you can see how that is darker than the outside cable, right? So here you have the outside of the bone as it was exposed to its flesh. And then this breaks, and then as the flesh starts decomposing, it starts seeping into this location, kind of staining it a dark brown. It's not a lot there, it's just a little bit. And it's mostly interesting to me right about there where it's a little bit more orange. The orange comes from um, adipocere uh, decomposition, so the fat, and, uh, and that tends to be a little more Brightly colored than, let's say, muscle tissue. 
So you could say the fracture occurred before decomposition. Right. And that's what we mean by occurring when. If you do start decomposing pretty rapidly after you die, but it, depending on you know, what part and what conditions, it's all about temperature, uh, humidity, and availability. But you don't know if that fracture was caused while Joseph was still alive. I don't believe so, um, and here's why. Um, when you are um, when you are injured, when you are alive, you usually start some form of cellular repair pretty fast, and even in the bone areas. I did look at it with a hand lens to see if I saw any kind of remodeling happening, and I didn't. Uh, so I put it at or around the time of death. I know it didn't happen some distance before his trauma event. And it could have happened then shortly after? It could have. So, as an example, if he is deceased and his body is being moved and some impact happens to that area. So, yeah, somehow he got impacted while he was already just absolutely that guy. Talk about Joseph McStay's remains. You said he was protected by like the fabric that was wrapped around him, so the decomposition was affected on the time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. And you said there was another body on top of him. Yes. What evidence was found in the grave that he had a body on top of him? It was the um, the Position, the superposition. So, so you have um, that's one of the reasons we go down in layers. So they encounter the um, the child first, and then him. Gianni, the one we saw, was found with some. Yes, but um, wasn't Joseph found with Joseph, Joseph Jr. was found with Joseph Senior. Yes, and. Again, do we know if this happened uh, 
Walt Joseph was alive or within uh, after he was deceased? This short is, period or long period? This would be pairing more because the bone was so moist when this happened. That's the only way this can happen. Um, but do we know how recently he had been breathing? Is that what you mean? Uh, you know, within hours. Okay, so death, a little bit before death, a little bit afterwards. That's what we know. So based on the fracture, you can say he it was close to his time of death. Yes. At what point is it impossible to have those type of fractures after someone's deceased? We haven't done controlled studies of that. I can tell you that within the ex the experience I have over the 20 years I've been doing this, uh, usually already within a few days we have a problem there. So without studies, but based on your experience, it could be a couple days? <clears throat> yes. Did you see any signs of the healing that you like to see if it's... Uh, I did not. So if Joseph McStay Sr. is deceased and his body is being moved and something applies pressure to the leg in the right direction during the time he put into the ground, that could be consistent with this type of when you say pressure, you mean like pushing? Because no. Whatever kind of force is necessary to cause this type of pressure. Could it be after he had after he had expired that that would that that could happen? So something hits him with the right speed and force and weight. Yes. As long as it's within a couple days. Yeah, although. Imagine a situation in which that would occur. <laughs> well, I'm not asking to inspect Based on the testimony you were saying, on the weathering you saw, you say that the body, the remains that were found outside the grave, were likely within six months. Likely within six months. That's based off of the work of Allison Galloway again. Now, is that the only the pieces that were shown to you in court, or is that everything? <clears throat> All of the stuff that was outside of the room, outside of the grave. Correct. I would probably broaden my estimate to uh, less than two years, but probably six months. That's uh, since then I've seen a couple more cases that, that would give me pause to say I might need to broaden that a little bit. And how many cases have you worked regarding the discovery of remains that have been weathered, like in our environment in the desert? Hundreds. And based on those cases, did you have details that helped you to give a time frame to what you're seeing? <coughs> like, do you see a bleached out or weathered bone when you find out in the investigation this happened six months ago or nine months ago when they were last seen? Did that kind of information help you in your determination and your evaluation of the it, it informs my evaluation because San Bernardino is kind of special 
it has five different um, microphones. And so I, I know a lot about them because I live in one of them. But uh, each, time you, each time you get a new set of remains, you get a new set of experience. And then if you, can, if you find out, OK, that person's last seen in June, and it is now November, and it looks like this, and I go, OK, store the, the backups. And that's you know, a learning process. And when you do that, do you do uh, those comparisons based solely on memory, or do you notate things for photographs that from you take another cases and then assign a time frame so you can refer back to them? Um, folks, I, I, I do rarely refer back. Um, I hope my memory has not been awesome during this case, but it's typically much better than this. So there's not something to like you have a database that you keep saying, these are what I've seen that I know is six months old, these are the pictures I know that are nine months old. I'm afraid I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> and these kind of observations, do you share them with other colleagues so you can um, kind of compare notes or compare opinions as to the time frame you're establishing? Not typically. I did have a colleague that we, we would talk about those things, but he was actually a deputy coroner, not an anthropologist. And then we have Obviously, at conferences, we talk about you know uh, this whole idea of times and stuff is called taphonomy. We have a whole section of taphonomy where we talk about that. But most of my colleagues uh, don't work in the desert. Most of my colleagues work in swamps and other places that are lonely. And does this subject ever become a subject that you teach? Where um, so they see you're a, a faculty member at multiple universities. Is this one of the subjects that you can use? Uh, the subject to teach students. We, yes, but I don't think we ever actually teach specifically how to time weathering. We talk about how to find sources to help you define weathering. Let me uh, interrupt you at this point. It's about noon, so we're going to take our new recess till 1.30 this afternoon. Again, keep in mind the admonitions previously given to you, not to form or express any opinions about the case, not to discuss the case, and we'll see everyone uh, at 1.30.